So the speakers today have come at this with regard to CO2 emissions and so on. We've come at this from a product innovation perspective. So sustainability to us, extended track life, um, reduced maintenance and whole life costs, we've come out from a product innovation. So the self-compensating sleeper, as we affectionately call it, the SCS, is a sustainable cost-effective method of maintaining track. So it's a product and a method of use. And you can see here in the background, the sleeper used on these two track transitions. So it's a co-invention between myself and my friend, Dr. Phil Sharp, and its inception was over 10 years ago. So we've been working on this for a very long time. So why and where did we start? We started at the point of track transitions to or an area that Phil and I had a lot of interest in, both from a geotechnical perspective and a superstructure uh, perspective with regard to track. So you would, as you would expect, most track engineers, P-way engineers, would like to design a track transition with a smooth track stiffness. But this is only one part of a track transition. Obviously, you've got your unloaded and loaded profile and your elastic profile, and you would like to think that your track would stay in that position and give you good track geometry retention. But ballast settles as soon as it's embedded and as soon as you've run that track, uh, it, it starts to settle. So you get some settlement and elastic and plastic deformation there. The next stage is under large traffic movements that settlement occurs and ballast starts to migrate. So you start to get, as people call, a bow wave effect off the back end of track transitions. So from direct fastened track, could well be ballastless track, it could be a long timber bridge, it could be a steel deck. But normally, the direct fastened track holds its um, position and retention um, with a known, generally a known track deflection, whereas during the ballastless section in the track transition, dependent upon what length, um, you normally get heavy plastic settlement, hanging sleepers, and so on. So just an example of one of uh, Network Rail's problematic sites, probably a well-known site to most people here, is Bridge 144 on the East Coast Main Line. As you can see, it's got heavy ballast migration. Uh, it's got serious settlement and voiding, loss of track geometry, issues with the bridge deck and the fastenings, and the, they had issues here with broken rails and track buckles. So it's just a, a key site that we've considered and looked at over a period of time. So what is the self-compensating sleeper? It's an innovative track support system designed to improve track geometry and reduce maintenance at locations where you get irregular track support and discontinuities in track. So the medium we've used at the moment is a malleable SG iron. It's based on uh, the, Schwiag self uh, the Schwiag cable management sleeper. It can have various different uh, base, approved base plate systems, which I'll come on to. But the part of the invention is the reservoir system either side of the rail itself. So to give you some detail here, it's a modular system where each of these elements can be taken away or replaced if required. The product allows stone to be rapidly filled in from the top of the reservoir and to disseminate down through the cone and allows you to do compaction with the stone. So the stone that we use here is stone blowing stone and that goes directly into the reservoir here. So this is uh, a temporary cap as part of the trial. We do have a new one. So stone is placed in, disseminates down, and when there's a void, the stone drops, fills the void, eliminates the void, and the sleeper then self-compensates vertically. If there is no void, then the sleeper will not self-compensate. So effectively, it will not lift. The system, when it's placed in track, does not require tamping, so very good around 
track transitions where you cannot get tampers up right up to the edge anyway. And the lateral configuration and confinement of the system ensures that there's a good st stress distribution underneath the sleeper. So we've made sure that there's controlled stress distribution and also controlled deflection with regard to the sleeper itself. So I'm hoping that gives you an idea of how it works. So effectively, stone falls, fills the voids, and the sleeper moves upwards to compensate. So over many years of development, testing, um, empirical modeling with regard to the mechanical aspects of the product. So we've done approved base plate systems to EN13481 and the test method 13146, but also the three point bend test analysis against 16431. So to make sure that this sleeper and the cable management sleeper that we were intending using could take um, the self-compensation mechanism within it and would uh, meet its requirement. And we found that to, to uh, our acknowledgement that the sleeper itself had no critical fatigue stresses in it with regard to anything well above uh, the 25 tonne axle load. So as I say, we'd done a lot of testing over many years, so rigorous in the fact of mechanical testing right through to trying to simulate its operational performance. So this test rig here is called a Puma rig. It's between very expensive high-end testing equipment and empirical modeling. It's a precision unbound material analyzer piece of kit. Um, and it's there to test unbound, hydraulically bound, and asphalt materials. So it's a well-known piece of kit in the road pavement industry. And we use this bit of kit to test our mechanism and understand the self-compensation effects. So, like I say, we simulated a realistic situation. So first of all, we had this system working on standard ballast, so just ballast on its own. It's almost like a, a CBR-style test. This has a, a, it's a steel strain gauge band, so it expands understanding what is happening with the ballast and where ballast movement and pressures come from. We looked at comparing that with the SCS settlement, the characteristics with regard to conventional sleepers and what our sleeper was doing at the time. And we did that. This at the top is just one example of one test that we did in excess of 1.8 million load cycles, so 45 million gross tons. So we really set this ballast to task as well as the sleeper itself. And just to note, inside this reservoir, we also have a, a resilient medium in there, which assists with ballast attrition and degradation, so it stops that from happening. So as part of self-compensation, when voids occur, we call this self-compensation. But ballast, as we know, continually rotates, moves, and has some movement. It's not a fixed structure, a fixed element. So what we also saw was um, micro self-compensation. So the sleeper is basically holding its geometry and its retention. So it's continually holding its position. The stone is continually moving and the sleeper is holding its level. And as part of this, we determine the optimal stone size. Um, so this sleeper, without any stone in, would perform better than a standard sleeper. With the wrong stone in or with contaminants in it, it will also do the same, so it's a step change. And the optimal would be with stone blowing stone set out to our specification and our installation procedure, which you'll see coming further on, which is very simple. And here in the bottom, you can see the sleeper. We had to simulate, because we had a fixed arm here, we had to simulate the methods of the cone moving up and voids being created to demonstrate self-compensation. And this was done over several sections of tests.
So as part of the sleeper itself, we acknowledge that the sleeper and its form and function gave very high lateral and longitudinal resistance. So pretty much getting to the point where it's well over 50% better than a standard sleeper because you've always got stone on stone contact. And also the fact that the sleeper was holding its geometry was um, also a, a big bonus. The base resistance within the sleeper, so effectively, not to blow uh, the rail industry's mind, but we could almost take the middle of that sleeper out and have it almost like a bi-block system within ballast. It holds that much retention. We actually don't really need the middle of the sleeper or the ends. So we could take um, ballast shoulders away. So the base resistance of the sleeper, the end resistance and the longitudinal was greatly in increased. So the sleeper itself, there are, and I won't bore you to death with the places that we could use it and can use it, but if you cast your mind anywhere where you've got voiding, settlement or discontinuities in track, any type of track, this sleeper can be used. But just some examples here, most types of conventional rail, most types of base plated system for different gauges, um, checked systems, so very good for lateral stability in tight curves in ballast, and especially going on in, on and in into structures and also on and out of tunnels as well. And as I've said, we can optimise the stiffness. So we have two standard sleepers, one which gives a standard stiffness and also one which is a slightly reduced height, which we've used on a, a site, which you'll, I'll come on to. So as part of our development work with Network Rail under a non-disclosure agreement, um, and this is a patented product, we took it to a site after we'd done all this year's worth of testing to prove that the system actually did what it said on the tin. And we took it to a depot site, we took one sleeper, and it was mainly for Network Rail to hold it, use it, get it in their hands to see and what they could do with the manipulation, what type of equipment we would and could use. So the equipment we used was standard equipment. This sleeper, we were very lucky that we could run the stone blowing train backwards and forwards over it. So we we're also able to take some level surveys and put some dynamic load on it at the time. So a lesson we learned was that compaction of the stone in the cone prior to loading provided immediate support and also reduced uh, the stone, which I'll come on to at a later date. A two-stage filling process, which was very simple, and you'll see a short video, gave optimal results. Backfilling of the cribs, so when you install it, you fill to the bottom of the sleeper, you fill in the reservoirs, and then you backfill, and you lift the sleeper, five mil, and you run track over. You can run track over before that, which I'll come on to uh, in the next slides. So lifting and placement via standard equipment was easy. So plate laying equipment, standard track, like applying a standard sleeper, basically. So site one, Craven Arms, Chenny Longville, on the Wales and Western route. In the early 1990s, the track form here, this bridge deck, was a new bridge deck and a new slab track um, direct fixation was installed. By the early 2000s, there were some serious problems evident with regard to movement and settlement in this piece of track, albeit underneath here, there is a concrete stepped track transition which was a methodology within geotechnical and track transitions many years ago to try and make some sort of method of support um, on and off structures. It was evident that this didn't completely help the situation. So at the time, Scott Wilson did some work and some studies, and you can see here in the track transitions that at that time you got very heavy uh, vertical deflection 
in track and you really didn't have good control of the track and track geometry. So at one point here, you've got well in excess of 30 millimetres of vertical movement. So this is the track vertically moving and bouncing up and down. A permanent strict speed restriction was applied to this location um, and that stayed on until we installed the SCS system at this location. So a bit more detail about this site. Here in the top left hand corner, it's a, an underbridge, crosses cross dual track, up and down track. You can see here in the summer, you can see ballast, heavy ballast degradation. They've got issues here in the bottom corner of wet beds and ballast uh, attrition. This is the concrete deck here at the bottom and you can see the step track transition, um, which is a, an image taken from the rail track days. Direct fixed track, of which they were having issues with regard to the track fastenings on that deck because of hanging sleepers here, effectively. And you can see that properties are extremely close nearby to the running rail. So at these track transitions, we installed the SCS. We installed nine SCS off each end of the structure. So that's four track transitions. We took out the existing sleepers with standard road rail equipment, um, took the ballast away to the required depth, left the rail in place, slid the SCS system underneath with base plates included, a little bit like um, the, comp the composite sleepers earlier, slid them underneath, clipped them up to the required spacing, did not touch the existing track here, held these with jacks, filled the cribs up to underside of the sleeper, filled the cones up, compacted the cones, filled the crib up, lifted its position and ran track. And what we did on this site also is prior to us handing this track back, we used this site in each of these track transitions with network rail as a test in terms of what would it be like if we didn't compact what would it be like if we ran a road railer over it without putting the ballast, uh, the crib ballast back? And we found that we could actually run uh, staged road rail vehicles to in excess of 16 tonne axle load over this without putting the cribs back at all and without losing uh, track geometry. So we could run um, the maintenance and, and installation equipment backwards and forwards. And I'm hoping with Craig's help, we can get this video working here. So this is the SES in place, and this is the reservoir being filled up with stone. So Phil and I devised a filling mechanism, and this is the compaction of the stone. And believe me, once you've filled that, you've compacted with a standard rail bar, you know you've got compaction. It, you literally cannot compact. It takes minutes, um, and it's very easy to, uh, to do and in install. Again, I'm hoping Craig will help again with this uh, video. So this is that track prior to the installation. Just here in the flash, you can see there is a skewed joint on the track. So the bridge deck isn't perpendicular to the running rail. You can see that the sleepers are bouncing and hanging. So we have uh, uplift in the track as well as big vertical um, deflection under settlement and permanent deflection. And there we um, did a ballast dig just to make sure that we've got an understanding of uh, the track heights. So again, Craig, sorry. <laughs> so this is after installation, removal of the temporary speed restriction. Basically, we put the track back in and within a matter of uh, a day, we'd open all of those routes up and got rid of the temporary speed restriction that never came back again. Um, as part of this, we did monitoring. So we did level surveys. We ran the track recording car over it. And in the next slide, you'll see we did um, 3D optical displacement measurements. We also had some um, deflection monitors on there as well, looking at the difference between the last SCS and the first um, 
existing sleepers. So this graph here shows the existing before seven millimeters of displacement and uplift. This is scaled down. This is the site afterwards and the overlay. You can see we have now no uplift and we have up to a millimeter's worth of vertical deflection. Now the difference between the seven mil here and the one mil is that this system is in excess of 80% uh, resilient underneath that one millimeter of load. So we have a resilient system. This track form here just had a very stiff rail pad with a concrete sleeper. We have two levels of resilience in our system. So follow up to those sites. Those sites, uh, or this site has been running before track transitions, daily frequent traffic, passenger traffic, freight and heritage. It's been in track for well over two years at up to line speeds of 90 mile an hour with very low maintenance solution. We also deployed it at a second site, which is the um, Blackbridge site, which is the one Jane was talking about earlier, where the bridge was lifted by uh, a metre to a metre and a half. So we deployed it on either end of the track transition here. So we have a property very close to the track. So noise and vibration was greatly reduced by this product due to its resilience and its track geometry retention. And also here at this end, so very steep uh, gradient and bank um, as part of this bridge lift and replacement. We're also deploying it again on a further longitudinal bridge. This is Cod's Head, uh, Barnstaple, also a um, passenger route, daily operation up to 70 miles an hour. And this will, because of this type of location, this will have 15 sleepers on either end of the track transition. So I've got two slides of summary. This slide here is directly from Network Rail's operation and maintenance teams. So prior to the installation of the SCS um, and before the installation, there was poor geometry and there were existing wet beds. Frequent, frequent maintenance was part of the, the standard here, at least an eight person team to go out and maintain the site um, at equal less than six weekly basis to either alternate dig or to measure shovel pack to reinstate that site and its geometry. After installation, we improved the track stability, resulting in greatly reduced maintenance. The wet bed was completely eliminated and the SCS had a significant difference on the maintenance approach. So we've talked to Network Rail and obviously it's, a, it's, it's at the passenger level, it's at the derailment risk level. Um, and we've at least got to in excess of a 12 weekly program, but this program is more visual inspection looking inside the reservoirs, does it need topping up? So the ballast cribs do not need to be touched or maintained or dug out in any way, shape or form. And that approach has taken the maintenance schedule task to a cost and an operative for an hour. So huge reduction in men and men hours. And it's improved the asset reliability and certainly lowered the whole life cost. So in summary, it's an innovative modular track system for irregular track support and discontinuities. It improves the track stability and support and the operational life, so giving longevity to the track. And when maintenance is, re is required, it's at a slow degradation, not on a Friday night do you need to go on a Saturday morning to rush out and maintain it. It can be maintained and monitored over a period of time. It could be used for new, existing, and also retrofit track beds. It can be installed with standard plate laying um, and P-way equipment. It reduces the track maintenance intervention at these void and settlement low, uh, zones and areas. So not just at track transitions, it might well be a culvert, it might be running into S&C, it might be in a track tunnel. You use your imagination further. Um, it greatly reduces the maintenance costs at these areas, which you can see in the man hours, um, and also the deployment of people to tight locations where you cannot maintain very easily. 
and reduces noise and vibration due to it holding its track retention from its first basis, but also being resilient and able to have this linear track transition. So there is a, there is a track standard with regard to stiffness, but that doesn't directly correlate to voiding and settlement. So there's a half second rule and a 0.7 second rule, which Europeans and people in the world in the ISO use for track stiffness, but it doesn't correlate directly to um, track, stiff, uh, track voiding and track settlement. There is some correlation with, with stiffness, but not with voiding. So yeah, I'm hoping that that gave you a good insight to the self-compensating sleeper product, its method of use, the invention that Phil and I have created. Um, if you need to get in touch with any technical information, this is myself and Schwiag are the sales and manufacturer of the product and uh, they will supply that to the industry worldwide. And thank you very much. <laughs>